Tim Harford's book, The Undercover Economist Strikes Back, Chapter 5 on Stimulus, there's an opening discussion about the idea that is very similar to what we call Ricardian equivalence. Harford talks about this basic argument of how fiscal policy could have some limitations. If we decide to reduce taxes right away, right now we're going to reduce taxes with the hope of having expansionary fiscal policy, well, it could be somewhat limited if people are consumption smoothing, right? So what is consumption smoothing? Harvard is saying, hey, when we reduce taxes, it's like we have extra money in our wallet. Like, this is great. And so the idea of expansionary fiscal policy is we have extra money in our wallet. We're going to go off and spend it. That will increase aggregate demand and the economy will be fixed, right? Well, Harford argues that the standard economic model argues for consumption smoothing. The idea is that when we get some kind of chunk of money, say we no longer have to pay some taxes and we get $2,000, or even if we say got uh, a Christmas bonus of $2,000, what we would do is essentially a, a very simple version of consumption smoothing would be we would divide this up over the rest of our lifetime spending. So if we got a $2,000 Christmas bonus, and we expect to live 20 more years, what we would do is we would divide the 2000 by 20, and that gives us $100. So each year, we now spend 100 extra dollars. So each year for the next 20 years, we spend an extra $100. So we have eventually spent that $2,000, but we smooth that over our entire life lifetime. Right? So if we get a chunk of $2,000 this year, all we really do is spend an extra $100 this year, and the rest of the money goes through, throughout the rest of our lifetime. We adjust throughout our overall lifetime what our spending decisions should be based on future and current gains in money, losses in money, etc. So if we get a chunk of money now because we no longer have to pay the taxes, that's great, but we're only going to kind of increase our consumption a little bit. And also what's gonna happen is we are gonna know that the government isn't just, hey, we're just gonna decrease taxes and that's it. They're eventually gonna have to make up some of that tax money. Well, how are they gonna do that? They're gonna tax us later. And so we adjust the later payments that we are going to have to make into today's buying and spending and investing habits. And so we get something very similar to this idea of Ricardian equivalence. Now, Harford in his chapter says, you know, but people don't always work perfectly this way. We're not so perfectly calculated that we do all of these things. When somebody gets a Christmas bonus, a lot of times they do spend a little bit uh, more than their fair share uh, uh, of that bonus, right? They don't just spend 1 20th of it if they expect to live 20 more years. They spend like two thirds or three quarters of it and then just save a little bit of it. Maybe even they spend more than that. Right? So people project that their taxes are going to go up later, they consumption smooth, they do all these things that make the challenge of fiscal policy a little bit harder. But Harford argues they don't do it perfectly, though. They don't do it perfectly. Harford continues his analysis by tying to another popular critique of fiscal policy or the limitations of fiscal policy. He talks about the crowding out theory in a way. He argues that the economy has to be such that it's not doing well and that when we go into a deficit, which is what we do with fiscal policy to try and expand the economy, what we're doing is we have to borrow money in order to do that. Right? If we're going into a deficit, we have to borrow some money to do that. We're spending more than the revenue that we're bringing in, so we have to borrow. Well, when we borrow, we have to make sure that we are not driving out private borrowing already taking place. We have to really assume that the economy is in a big slump and that people aren't eager to borrow and that we have to borrow such that we are not driving out private borrowing that's already taking place. Harford then takes these two ideas, Ricardian equivalence and the crowding out, and says there's really three catches to using fiscal policy. The three catches are really this idea that it's hard to kind of recognize and understand where we're at in the economy. It's, it's similar to Milton Friedman's argument of the fool in the shower and also the crowding out effect. 
right? That you, the economy has to be in a slump. You have to recognize exactly where you're at. If you spend the resource prices and interest rates can rise and hold back the correction of the economy, we can have adjustments taking place. We need to know that we are definitely below full employment. There is this hard limit on what the economy can supply. And we might be just be transferring from private sector spending to government sector spending if we're not careful and we don't recognize the situation that we're in. So we have to do fiscal policy only when there's untapped resources. And what we're doing is we're tapping into those unemployed resources and using those to kind of spur the economy and actually push aggregate demand forward instead of tapping into resources that were already being used in the private sector and now instead just using them in the government sector which doesn't really do anything for boosting aggregate demand it's just transferring from the private to the public sector so we have to recognize correctly to avoid the crowding out effect that's his first issue the second issue that Hartford raises, the second catch to fiscal policy, is that the multiplier could actually be less than zero if you spend your money in the wrong place. He gives this as kind of a shocking idea, but this really relates to the idea of Ricardian equivalence. The idea could be that you could uh, drop your taxes now, or you could spend government money, as the example that he uses. You could spend a bunch of money, but you could spend it in the wrong place. And what happens is a Ricardian equivalence effect. People understand that spending now is going to lead to further future taxes, right? So into the future, there's going to be increases in taxes. So what people do is they stop some of their spending now because they know that they're going to have to offset some of the higher tax rates into the future. So people reduce their spending right now. Well, if your government spending right now is on, in his example, purchasing a bunch of French wine from French producers of wine, then our GDP has not gone up any, our aggregate demand hasn't gone up any, we've not increased any of our output, nothing like that. The multiplier effect isn't gonna be circulating through the United States. And so we've increased our aggregate demand none, and yet we've decreased our aggregate demand some because our taxpayers know that they're gonna to have to pay for this into the future even though you're not asking them to pay for it now, you are increasing government spending and they know that's gonna come with a future bill. And so they decrease some of their consumption and investment now. And so we have this Ricardian equivalence problem as Harford's second catch. But then the third catch he hadn't covered yet and he only covers quite quickly. And it's this idea that one-off programs required by our approach are quite hypothetical and not real in practice. How do we get rid of fiscal policy programs once they're no longer needed. This is very similar to the public choice critique of fiscal policy. Is it actually practical in reality? Do we have the incentives for politicians to implement a policy in the short run and then get rid of that government spending or that policy? It's very hard to actually structure this type of program and have it only do what it is meant to do and not stick around longer than that. So how much stimulus is fiscal policy actually providing? Is fiscal policy a good idea? Are these critiques damning? Or are they just small critiques that limit how powerful fiscal policy can be, but fiscal policy is still a really important tool? Are we ever likely to get rigorous economic data that can definitively tell us the relative merits of fiscal policy worldwide? Tim Harford argues no. We don't have the natural experiment going through the context just the same. We can't have world A and world B, and in world A we use this type of fiscal policy, and in world B we have a controlled experiment, and we can see, oh, how well did this help this time? There aren't really great natural experiments when it comes to macroeconomics because too many variables can change. So what Harford suggests is a relative kind of balanced approach to fiscal policy. He doesn't uh, completely criticize it. He allows for fiscal policy to potentially still have some impact, but only when the conditions are right. This is a fairly mainstream view, uh, but you know others have criticisms. There's plenty of debate within macroeconomics, but let's think about what Harford's kind of four-step plan to using fiscal policy really is. So what Harford says is, 
the four steps are as follows. First, you got to start thinking about the program in advance so you actually have good ideas, right? You don't want to be doing something that is actually going to be harmful to the economy, like buying imported French wine or things like that, um, when we could have issues like Ricardian equivalents going on. Right. So we got to end up with a list of good programs that we would like to implement if we were ever to use fiscal policy. Right? Harford elsewhere argues that, listen, we're often going to be doing government spending and not cuts in taxes because some ta cuts in taxes will go straight into savings or they'll be spent on things like imported French wine. Whereas with spending, you can be sure that the money is spent on things that are good ideas. Tax cuts usually can happen pretty quickly. With spending, it might take a little longer, but we can know that we are doing it in good programs. Only though, if we've done step one, we've started thinking about the programs in advance. Step two, Harford's gonna say, use monetary policy as a first line of defense. Don't go with fiscal policy as that first go. Instead, rely on other macroeconomic ideas and concepts, monetary policy being Harford's uh, preference here. But third, if that doesn't work, if this, the first line of defense, monetary policy doesn't work, then you go with fiscal policy. So it's only once everything else has failed that we go with fiscal policy, step three of Harford's four-step plan. And then step four is to make sure your projects don't make people nervous about repayment issues. Make sure we can get rid of these programs and that they really are just one-off issues. Make sure that we're not driving ourselves into incredible debt that people understand that they're going to have to pay for these programs into the future and make adjustments now and start to distrust what the government is actually doing. So Harford has this four-step plan that he thinks is kind of the mainstream, his view on what macroeconomic policy, policy should be given these limitations to fiscal policy and yet given the idea that some stimulus can sometimes be a required thing.